another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is his own personal film historian from his own experiences and executive producer on many a, many a low-budget horror film. I'm talking to Peter Oxley. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good afternoon, Stuart. And we're going to talk about, first off, your rememberings of having a video shop and the video nasties of the 1980s, plus a little bit about the new films you're working on, and then we're going to do three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. Yep. Does that sound like what you've signed up for? Yep, sounds good to me. Let's start at the beginning then. What's your first inroad into sort of video shop working? Was it your own? Was it working for somebody else? No, I was a manager at uh, a video store in um, Goodmay, Zilford. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd just been made redundant after seven years. So uh, I then, I was was into films then anyway. And so it was about 1984, five. And it was just at that time when I got the job that, of course, we had the video nasties, the pirate movies, and all this sort of like came out. So Mm. it was an interesting uh, time to put it mildly. And out of interest, have you seen Prano Bailey Bond's film, Censor, which is set around that period? Uh, yeah, I have seen it once, yeah. yeah. I've so is it, that yeah. is that video shop representative of a video shop of the time? <laughs> yeah, you could say uh, partly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, some of the people, we even had police coming in for whether they was uncut adult films hmm. or... Uh, films that were not out on uh, release, or as you said, video nasties, films like Driller Killer, Death Trap, Chainsaw Massacre, those films, some of them actually were getting sort of like banned just because of the covers, mm. i.e. Driller Killer, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. A drill going through somebody's head. And uh, really the film, there was only one or two bits in it that was quite uh, gory and violent. Yeah, it was. it's, it's largely a kind of dull dull art house movie that has has moments of visceral violence. Well, yeah, yeah. So um, obviously uh, we had other movies. You'd get the, what I call, um, could be the um, widescreen wasn't overly available then. Mm. But what you'd get, you film like The Wild Bunch yeah. that had come out, and they'd release it in pen and scan. So, you know, what will happen is it's all too big uh, for your TV. So when the gunshot goes in the chest, you don't actually see it explode. You just see the look on the face. <laughs> so you, all those, yeah, those problems as well. And you'd have somebody come in and say, here, mate, do you want a copy of uh, Alien? And you'd say, uh, yeah, okay, then it's not out yet. You put it on, it'd either be so dark, you could see absolutely nothing. Or the other thing, they'd recorded it in the cinema, so all of a sudden, You'd be watching it, and you'd see somebody get up and walk out to Classic. go to the loo, or you'd hear popcorn crisps munching away, like you know. Oh yeah, great times they were. Really I miss I miss those bootlegs of the somebody just standing up in the middle of the while you're watching it when you realise <laughs> where they got it from. Out of interest, you know the whole kind. Of, I mean, this is this is more like from your, your kind of cliche of the kind of adult video store. But when you're in a you know post the video recording app when there was films were getting harder and harder to get. Did you have people coming in asking for the Texas Chainsaws and the Cannibal Holocausts sort of under the oh, counter? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You'd have loads of people coming in, um, regulars or people who want to join, and they'd look at they'd, they'd go around the shop and look at things and say, oh, yeah, but ain't you got so-and-so? It was uh, released, like, on the cinema two weeks ago or whatever. Hmm. And you'd say, well, no, that, that won't be out for, like, uh, probably about two, three years on DVD, mm. not like three now uh, or whatever. And so, yeah, so you'd say uh, they'd take it away and they'd come back and then they'd complain that the quality was rubbish on it. Like, you know, they say, oh, it was all fuzzy, it was too dark, it was this. Um, or you get the other ones that um, they'd be recorded and then halfway through you'd be watching, say, a film like Death Trap Hmm. Uh, um, with Neville Brand, the one at the hotel with a crocodile that eats everybody, and uh, you'd be uh, you'd be watching that, and all of a sudden it'd go off somewhere else, and you'd see a bit of a, a porno film, really? and then it'd go, yep, yeah, and then you think, oh hello, this looks okay, and then all of a sudden it'd go back into the film again. <laughs> um, it was 
you know, where they hadn't actually t- took something out or whatever. So it was, uh, as I say, you just didn't know what you was going to get going to get back then. Like, you know. What's a, what, what would be, what's a favourite memory of yours from working in a video shop in the nineteen eighties? When it got raided by the police, probably. Well, I remember the the governor of the shop. He was never there. He was always away skiing or somewhere. So he left me in charge. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody must have um, sort of like complained or whatever to the police because we had about uh, three coppers turn up and said, oh, like we've been told that, uh, and they took about, um, oh, about 20 20 video um, players away, Betamax and VHS. What, the actual uh, players? The actual players, not tapes? Yes, they took. Because what the, the governor was doing out the back, he was recording them from one to the other. Oh, so, uh, so if if you got in an uncut version of, say, Caligula, yeah, three hours and fifteen minutes or whatever, it'd be out the back and he'd be spinning off about twenty of them uh, to uh, to get done. So he's got a few in the shop, like you know. Um, so uh, yeah, so they took all the uh, all the stuff away. They bought it back. Um, but not all the items come back. There was about 30 or so uh, missing, including a few porno ones, Texas Chainsaw and that missing, which they confiscated, obviously, because they wanted them to have a look at uh, down the nick. But, uh, yeah, that was probably the most interesting when you're standing there and all of a sudden three coppers come in. I was just going to say, so what can I get for you today under the counter, lads? And then they said, well, no, we've come to have a look around the premises. So, uh, yeah. Good times they were. <laughs> and what what do you remember being a, a a popular sort of under the counter request? What film was a what film was a, a recurring one that people would ask for that wasn't generally available? I think normally, funnily enough, it was either um what, like either Texas Chainsaw Massacre or some of the cannibal films. Okay. Like cannibal Ho- Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah. And uh, one or two of them, people used to come in and say, Oh, have you got like snuff movies, and we'd say, "Well, no, you know." You, Seriously, we, yeah, honestly, and we'd say, "No, we don't have nothing to do with those." Like, you know, anything uh, like that is just like, you know, we don't want the shop closed down within like a couple of days. Like, you know, so uh, yeah, you'd be amazed the sort of things people would want to watch. You know what I mean? Not just like just basic horror films with a bit of gore and violence, and yeah. they just wanted. To think, really out of this world you know and uh, something that we would not never do you know at the time and i was two years in there was but it? it was a very yeah between 80 i think 85 and 87 so it was an interesting uh period of time that was like that was uh, the proper wild west time because like 1989 is the first ever blockbuster and then suddenly it's sort of high street chains and stuff before then it was it was the wild yeah. west of independent video shops wasn't it a lot of the companies had themselves to blame because Disney would not release any of their classic films. Mm. If you recall back then, they'd release something um, that wasn't remotely a classic. And then what they'd do is uh, all the ones, the uh, classic animated ones like Snow White, Dumbo, they wouldn't release them. Of course, people then want to see them and they were copying them. Yeah. So it was another thing. Those Disney ones under the counter. And a lot of these big companies um, had themselves to blame because if they bought out and decided to release things quicker, you know, then there would be no need to have it. You know, like now, everything basically comes out within a few months. And, of course, you've got everything uh, downloaded, uh, Netflix, internet, and what what have you. So uh, the days of sort of like pirating are a lot less, I think, than what they used to be back in the day. After them years working in video shops, what what got you? What was your segue into getting involved with making your own films or getting involved with people well, t- making films? Yeah, well, what happened was I took early retirement. I was lucky enough to get early retirement um, at fifty one. Very lucky, uh, I'm fifty one, and I'm nowhere near retiring. <laughs> I worked for the government for several years, um, looking after uh, ministers and. Uh, people would pay you not to look after them now, wouldn't they, really? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, when I retired, uh, the wife said to me, because she was a little bit older, she said she had three years to go, she said, well, you're not uh, 
you're not bloody retiring now. She said, you can get a part-time job for three years. So she actually made me get a part-time job for three years. <laughs> and then I thought, yeah. And I used to spend, when I was working, I used to spend four to six hundred pounds a month at HMV. Wow. So the best thing for me was when Amazon came along, because I was saving a hell of a lot of money, which is, as you know, I've got a collection of about eight and a half thousand various DVDs, but um, all legit. And I just wanted, and I, I came across uh, a producer um, once who actually had the same birthday as me, twenty mm. six of April, Jonathan Softcock, and uh, he said to me, um, "You know, are you interested in films?" I've, and then I got involved in um, putting some money into a couple of his films, and that is how it started. Really, that was in twenty seventeen. I also uh, got involved with a couple of other people as well, um, a couple of other directors, but I think Patrick Ryder, uh, James um, Crow, And um, as I said, it started there, and then I met Charlie, which uh, I've got a lot of time for. So that's and, Charlie. Uh, We're talking about Charlie Steed, who... Charlie. And Charlie Steed's been on the podcast. He was here when he was doing Barge People. Was that a film you were mm. involved with? Uh, no, that was one of the ones. I've actually been involved with four of his films, but yeah. uh, that... Not the barge people. Uh, I've been involved. Uh, the ones I've been, been involved with is uh, Winter Skin. Yeah. Uh, the main one, which I, I put quite a bit of dosh in, which was uh, an English haunting, mm -hmm. which uh, very proud of that one. And uh, obviously, there's the uh, another film, House of Violent Desire. Nice title that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> the latest one, which um, is uh, Gods of the Deep. So what is it what, for you as a you as a producer coming in working with a filmmaker like Charlie? What is it attracts you to what he's doing with film? What is it that excites you? Well, to me, he is just one of the most on a small budget. He yeah. is just one of the most original writer, producer, directors that we've got. I think independent in this country. Okay, uh, for a guy that's in his like twenties, oh, it's depressing, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah, I know, it's sickening. I've told him plenty of times. <laughs> and, uh, but um, and in fact, he's coming to my house in November, so I'm actually doing an audit so that he, none of my uh, DVDs disappear. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I've his films. Although we do a film on a small budget, yeah, so I don't know, ten thousand or whatever, um, they look very professional. They look expensive. And uh, as you see, when Gods of the Deep come out, it's the first time he's ever done this, this undersea creature film. Okay. And it looks so expensive as if it had cost millions. And it, and it doesn't, you know. Yeah. And the same crew and cast with him, and they're all a, such a lovely lot. It's all relaxed on set, but professional. And it's just enjoying um, working with a guy, really, you know. Brilliant. And it's something I've always wanted to do. For ever since I was about 13, was being involved with films and sort of like, as I said, he's made it happen. That's my segue then, uh, moving on from talking about Charlie's work to talking about three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. Right then, first out the gate uh, is Waterloo from 1970. Do you want to tell us... Why that's an important film to you? Where do you see that? Who do you see it with? Right. Well, that was actually with the school. Okay. Because um, uh, I was uh, 13 then. Yeah. And they were going on a school trip. A uh, historical... We went up to London and we saw Waterloo with uh, Rod Steiger and uh, Christopher Plummer. And um, obviously, I went and uh, at the time, I wasn't overly interested in movies, but seeing this... Uh, epic movie um, on the big screen. I just loved it, like, you know, uh, the action sequences. Which big screen did you see it at, Peter? I think it was at Leicester Square. Okay. Leicester so, Square. so the Empire. Yeah, yeah. And um, as I said, and it was just saying, and, and when I got back that day, and um, I was just so into, suddenly into movies, and obviously, that's why a lot of the David Lean films, your Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, I love all these sorts of massive epic films. Um, and it's something that I've had... Uh, what is it about the epic, epic film that you like? Well, that, um, I just think it takes you into another world. They're so vast. All right, 
they, they are between three and four hours, some of them. Mm. And uh, not all of them, you know, you can put, if you watch a fall of the Roman Empire, you can possibly fall asleep and wake up and still catch what's going on. <laughs> but I mean, a film like Spartacus, I mean, the three hours there just, you know, just, just flies by it for me, you know, and in more recent times, obviously Gladiator. So, I mean, there are a lot of great epic f- movies that were made for me in the 50s, 60s, Ben-Hur's, Ten Commandments, El Cid, those sort of films mm. uh, that I just love them, as I say. And, um, you know, uh, I can't get enough of them. The wife's not overly keen because um, after about an hour and a half, she gets fed up with them. But um, So I have to watch them when she's not in. But uh, as I said, I've always loved them ever since Waterloo. And I said, it's a 30 well, What do you remember? Old. I mean, because if you think about like now, we, we have we have a very bad attention deficit because of you know of our phones. Now, if I took thir- if I took a bunch of thirteen year olds to watch a three hour movie, I mean, would <laughs> would we get through the first hour? So, how was you and all your schoolmates at a, at a big epic like this? Was was everyone just wrapped, or was it was there a bit of like mischief? It, no, not really. I think everybody was wrapped because back then we didn't have CGI and over-the-top uh, CGI at that. You see, with Gladiator, what you get, you get uh, they only have half the crowd there. Everything else is computerised in, mm. whereas back in the day in Spartacus, the whole crowd would be in there. Mm. So you didn't have CGI back then. So it was all wondrous. And nowadays, the... the um, Kids, they just want something that they can watch quick with a load of action and not necessarily a story in it. That's basically it, really, as far as I'm concerned. You know, and I like a good story as well as a bit of action. What's what's a, what's a memorable scene for you from Waterloo? I think it was the actual main battle before uh, Steiger um, as uh, Napoleon loses when you see how they've got all these, and you see it from a distance all these soldiers and they're in squared formation yeah and all the other all, all the horsemen are all coming all around them and everything and it just looks as if there's just thousands of extras in it it just looks unbelievable you know you can watch it on a dvd but when you see it on the big screen it's just another thing altogether like you know um as i said so i'd always recommend somebody to go to the cinema first to watch a film especially a big film um like a bomb movie you know, you can watch them on the telly, but um, I've seen them all since um, uh, you only live twice on the cinema. So, um, yeah, uh, you so, can't yeah, say, So that's interesting. So so what you're saying is that, the you know, what we're talking now is 50, 53 years later, you still think the magic of the cinema is a is an important For part me, of watching a film. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've watched, as I said, with Bond. I've watched every Bond film that have ever come out since then. Uh, since 60, uh, well, I didn't see it in 67. I saw it in 71 in a double bill with uh, Diamonds Are Forever. But mm. uh, no, it's, um, yeah, for me, the magic is still going to the cinema and sitting there. You don't get the crowd you used to now. Uh, you might only have half a dozen people in there and his dog. Uh, whereas in the old days, it used to be packed to the rafters, like you'd be queuing outside to get in. Like, you know, even. Five minutes are up, Peter, your first one. Well done. Well done. That was interesting. Right then. Completely changing tone. Completely changing tone to uh, one of my favourite films I've ever, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm talking about Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A film from 1974, but as you tell me, it was released in London in 76. So where where did you see this in London in 1976, for starters? It was. It wasn't a major cinema exercise. What it was, it was doing a two or three week run in London. Yeah. Now I can't remember at the time whether um, what the actual cinema was, but it was a small cinema. It wasn't a major sort of you know cinema, uh, an Odeon, ABC as we had then, or any of those cinemas. Yeah. It was a small, like out the way one, and uh, I was nineteen at the time, and it was uncut then. Um, and obviously it only ran for two or three weeks before it got banned by the uh, London Council, and I don't think it got a full release again till the 90s, no, uh, if, I, if I remember. And 
I just was gobsmacked when I went and saw it um, because it, it was done so, obviously, it, it wasn't sort of like a, a lush horror film. It was done probably on the cheap. Just a little and, bit. Yeah. And, but it just looked so convincing. It was almost, to me, documentary. Oh, no, it's absolute cinema variety. Absolutely. And when, well, and when you see uh, the guy come out, uh, Leatherface come out for the first time, out there, like uh, making that noise and everything, it just scared the uh, crap out of me. Like, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, it just got me into horror movies. I thought after that, I thought, oh, blimey, you know. Um, and uh, I've got to, got to go and see his next film. But of course, uh, I think his next film, which was a couple of years later, which was Eaten Alive, Death Trap, uh, whatever you. Uh, want to call it? Um, I think actually also got, uh, if I remember, did, did get banned. Uh, mm. But um, yeah, so yes. But uh, and then obviously we we'll go on. I mean, Toby Hoop will go on to do some great movies uh, and even TV stuff like Salem's Lot, who many people think is uh, the best version of a Stephen King. You know, but um, yeah, but that Texas Chainsaw. I couldn't wait for it to come out. Uh, on uh, video to actually get a get a copy of it. No, and it was, um, it's a, it's sort of infamous, really, I suppose, because it's quite separate from the other video nasties in the sense of once James Furman took over at the BBFC, it almost mm. became like his film Bet Noir, almost like that was the film he was going to ban. Like no matter what, yeah. no matter how liberated we got watching horror films, we weren't going to ever see. No one's ever going to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre on home entertainment ever again. Um, no. And I mean, I, I paraphrase because I don't know the exact. I mean, supposedly there's the there's the speech, and it changes depending on how it's quoted. But it's something along the lines of because I think Texas Chainsaw played at London Film Festival in its mm. one of its original guises um, before it got a general release, and it's something like it's all very well for for us to watch this film, but if the if a factory worker in Manchester was to see this film, you know, oh, the world's going to end. You're like, my word, it's so weird to think. That people would be that you know yeah. a film that you can now just watch on demand whenever you want wherever you want. Well, he was the Mary Whitehouse of the movie world, wasn't he? Like you know, it, uh, he just loved to get things uh, banned. He would watch, and uh, we wasn't allowed to watch. No, and, and then he got inv- and then he got involved with his sort of if you just cut this and you cut that, and so he was almost like affecting that he wasn't doing edit, he wasn't censoring, he was actually. Offering filmmaker advice, you're like, are you the, are you the censor or are you the editor? It was a very mm. strange period. Um, so yeah. what for you? And so you've got like, I mean, what's interesting to me is that Sessions of the Massacre is 83 minutes long. So so it's an mm. in and you're out film. I mean, the, the absolute opposite to Waterloo in many senses. Um, and it's called the Texture Chainsaw Massacre, um, a name it was given after uh, I think one of the production design people playing a game of cards one night, because it was called Leatherface, the original, when the screenplay was written. It was never called Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and they changed the name, and he thought, that sounds good. And you don't actually see a chainsaw until 55 minutes into the film. Yeah, I know. It's uh, And I don't think the film, if you watch the film nowadays, you wouldn't say it was overly, uh, to me, overly gory or violent. It's not gory at of- all. It's it's all in the edit. It's all in your mind. You you yeah. the, the way that Toby's finished the film, and it's a bit like the you know the, the infamous scene in Reservoir Dogs where he cuts the policeman's ear off. Like what yeah. people came out of the cinemas thinking they saw, and what they really saw was very very different. Mm. That's our um, well, our next five minutes up. Oh, it's it, it speeds away like that. It speeds away from like that, Peter. Right then, final choice of your trio of films that have impacted everything in your adult life is 1949's White Heat. But you didn't see it in 1949. Where did you see, first see this film? Yeah, I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, I, actually, I actually saw this um, about 1977, I think it was on. So I would have been about 20. I saw it on the uh, BBC uh at the time, I think it was, yeah. And uh, again, um, I wasn't overly into gangster movies of that ilk of the 30s and 40s, but after seeing this movie, I just loved sort of like films of, with Bogart, Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, 
those sort of movies, and uh, they just got me interested. And um, as I said, and obviously Scarface, which is in '32, which was later remade with uh, Al Pacino in '83. Well, what was it about uh, White Heat that captured your imagination? You know, obviously you're you're a bit, but you're you're all, you're a young man, and you've seen like you, at this point you've you've seen you know one extreme Waterloo and another extreme you've seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So how does White Heat fit into that? Yeah, it's probably why I like every genre except for um, uh, rom-coms. But anyway, um, so um, basically, it was just Cagney's performance. He just took over the screen, you know, and um, it was a powerful performance. And I think Orson Welles summed it up. I think he said, with Cagney, um, a lot of actors that are in films, they go and do the performance but Cagney does it as if he's doing it in front of 10,000 audience on a stage. Is that convincing? And uh, so it was. I mean, if anybody's ever seen the film or hasn't seen the film, I'd advise you to see it, because for me, it's one of his sort of best ever performances in there. Um, And he goes out with a bang, as they say, uh, at the end of the film, when uh, he goes on the top of the building and... uh, he gets uh, fires the, the guns and everything, and he just blows up on the gas uh, cylinders on the top of the building. But uh, with the, no, with, the just... with the infamous line, Peter, well, that's, made that's it, man, right. top of the world. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's a line that you just will always remember. But in there, of course, also what's great about him um, as the gang leader, he suddenly has these sort of attacks where he gets these sort of pains. He, he, he ends up on the floor. He can't do anything and everything when he's in the prison. And the undercover cop that's in there mm. uh, helps him get through it and everything and then becomes one of the gang. Um, and he doesn't realise that. And uh, as I said, it's just a great story. And um, uh, one of the best, uh, I think, is it directed by Raoul Walsh, is it? Off, off the top of my head, I think who done a lot of uh, terrific movies um, in the 30s. And uh, as I said, it's black and white. Uh, a lot of people say nowadays, oh, I don't like black and white films. Well, they should watch uh, sort of Elephant Man or Schindler's List, mm. you know, because black and white films can still be made that are quality and good. Um, but as yeah, we, and I just, As we record this podcast, the latest podcast is for a brand new black and white film. From a by, by a British filmmaker called Mindset. And that was, well, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I mean, if you if you can watch Psycho or any of these great black and white movies, so the fact that they're still making them, uh, I think is a good thing. Um, you know, um, where do you get out of interest? Do you, see, think, do you see? Do you see any influence of a film like White Heat in British films? Because obviously, it's an American gangster film, but. Do you see? Can you see its legacy in any British films? Um, I don't know. I mean, I know. I know a lot of um, actors, the older actors, used to say, um, "Knights of uh, Michael Caine and uh, Bob Hoskins used to say they used to love those old uh, gangster films mm. and everything." Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think. Um, they're very American, as I said, when we make a gangster film over here, and we, we, we've tried it in the 50s and 60s with various uh, different films. Um, there are, are some good ones around that, that I, I would recommend, i.e. Uh, The Criminal with uh, Stanley Baker. I was about to say, you've took the words out of my mouth. You've got Hell is a City yeah. and, and Criminal with Stanley Baker, which are belters. Very, very good. Payroll is a very good one from about 61 to. And uh, a film with Darren Nesbitt called The Informers from 63, another very good black and white one. So they was getting made, but obviously once uh, we had... <laughs> on, finish your thought, finish your thought, finish your thought. Oh, I was just going to say to you, once we got to the 70s and we got Get Carter, we got Villain, we got Sitting Target with Ollie Reed, we suddenly got all these films followed by uh, Long Good Friday. Yeah. Uh, we had there that has gone on with things like the foot soldier films and all these other gangland films ever since Mm, absolutely absolutely well look that brings us to the end of uh, three films that have impacted everything in adult life that five minutes and half go quick doesn't it doesn't it well it's because you talk a lot about film i'm sure your wife knows this already yeah she knows too much um (laughs) she wants us 
my brother-in-law come over yesterday. I must tell you this. Um, he come over yesterday and he said, uh, oh, we've got a quiz in two weeks and it's going to be a film night quiz. He said, do you want to come over and you can be in the team? <laughs> he wants to see me because they've got a quiz going on and he wants me in, in the in the quiz like, you know. But um, no, I just love I just love talking about movies, Stuart. That's all it is. comes across very strong. So we did Waterloo from 1970, a film you saw on a school trip. Texas Chainsaw mm-hmm. Massacre, a film you saw as a young man in a small London cinema. And then White Heat, a film you caught on TV when you were a young man. A good selection there. Let's remind people then what 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 have you got coming? What we got coming up next on the Charlie Steed production line? What we got to look forward to? Right. Well, uh, Gods of the Deep, which mm. is a sort of horror science fiction under the water creature feature, mm. and I believe is hopefully coming out. So it's had a premiere, and it's coming out on DVD probably November. December time, I would say. Then I'm hoping, and I can't tell you the n- name of this film because obviously I'd have to shoot you. But um, <laughs> the uh, I'm doing a couple more, hopefully with Charlie in the new year, which he hasn't started filming yet. And um, so I've just got to decide what one or two I want to get involved with Brilliant. and give him more money. So that's basically it. Brilliant. Well, look, thanks for sharing that with us, and thank you very much for being on the Britflix podcast. Thanks. Yep, and it was a pleasure and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you soon.